Do you ever wonder how much truth lies beneath the tales of old? Ancient myths and legends filled with gods, heroes and fantastical beasts often seem too extraordinary to hold any factual basis. Yet there are instances where archaeology, history and science have unveiled truths hidden within these tales. Yes, some ancient myths have a kernel of reality within their layers of symbolism and metaphor. Today we are going to delve into seven fascinating cases where myth intertwines with history, where the lines between fact and fiction blur and ancient stories reveal their true colors. The city of Troy, famous in Homer's Iliad, was once considered purely fictional, a tale to fascinate listeners and readers. The city was described as grand, filled with mighty warriors and noble kings, and the setting for the legendary Trojan War. The Greek hero Achilles, the Trojan prince Hector, and the beautiful Helen. They were all characters in this drama, but could it be that these characters were not just part of an epic poem, but people who once lived and breathed? In the 19th century, archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann became fascinated with the idea that the Homeric legends had a basis in historical fact. Rather than dismissing the Iliad as mere fiction, Schliemann used it as a map. He followed the detailed descriptions and geographical clues that Homer had left in his text. His obsession brought him to Hisalik, a site in modern-day Turkey. In Hisalik, Schliemann began to dig. His excavations revealed a multi-layered city, one that had been built and rebuilt over the centuries. Artifacts dating back to the Bronze Age were found and the layout of the city matched that described in Homer's epic. The walls of the city, the gates, the placement of buildings, it all pointed to one conclusion. This was the site of the ancient city of Troy, Critics questioned Schliemann's methods and interpretations. They argued that his desire to find Troy may have led him to see what he wanted to see, but subsequent excavations by other archaeologists have supported Schliemann's claim. While it's challenging to prove that the Trojan War, as described by Homer, actually occurred, there's no longer any doubt that a city existed at Hisalik, a city that fits the description and timeline of Homer's Troy. Let's step into the ancient city of Babylon, one of the most famous cities of the ancient world and home to one of the seven wonders, the Hanging Gardens. This marvel is wrapped in an enigmatic aura, largely because despite numerous historical accounts of its existence, no physical evidence of the gardens has ever been found. But wait, how can something so grand, so monumental, simply vanish without a trace? The Hanging Gardens were said to be an architectural masterpiece, a testament to human ingenuity and a challenge to Mother Nature herself. They were purportedly built by King Nebuchadnezzar II around 600 BC for his wife Amitis, who was homesick for the lush green landscapes of her homeland media. It's like if you can't go to the mountain, bring the mountain to you. But this mountain was a little more than a mound of earth. This was a spectacular terrace garden filled with exotic plants and trees, adorned with intricate irrigation systems. Historians believe that the gardens were tiered, much like a ziggurat, with each level teeming with a diverse array of flora. The plants were not rooted in the earth directly, but in a roofed area where a complex irrigation system fed water from the Euphrates River. This marvel of engineering, essentially a primitive form of hydroponics, is a testament to the advanced understanding of engineering and horticulture by the Babylonians. The hanging gardens must have been a sight to behold. Imagine a city in the desert, its arid beige landscape broken by a towering structure teeming with greenery, a beacon of life and color cascading down in tears, a spectacle of nature suspended in the air. It was a marvel that, even in the absence of physical evidence, has left an indelible mark on the annals of human civilization. However, recent research has suggested that the hanging gardens may not have been located in Babylon at all. Dr. Stephanie Daly, an Assyriologist from the University of Oxford posits that the gardens were actually located in the Assyrian city of Nineveh. She bases her theory on a retranslation of ancient texts and points out that Babylon was often used in texts to refer generically to any area of Mesopotamia. Ah, King Midas, a character from ancient Greek mythology known far and wide for his ability to turn everything he touched into gold, aptly named the Golden Touch. This might sound like a superpower to most, but as the tale unfolds, we learn that it's not all it's cracked up to be. But where does this story come from and how does it stand up to the facts? King Midas was a historical figure, a Phrygian king who reigned in the 8th century BC. 
The ancient Greeks believed he was the son of Gordaeus and Cybele, the goddess of fertility. So far, so historical, right? But here's where it gets a little golden. According to legend, Midas helped the drunken Silenus, a companion of the god Dionysus, back home. In gratitude, Dionysus offered to grant Midas a single wish. Overwhelmed with greed, Midas wished for everything he touched to turn into gold. At first, Midas was overjoyed. The ability to generate infinite wealth with a simple touch seemed like a dream come true. But the dream rapidly turned into a nightmare. When he attempted to eat, his food turned into inedible gold. When he tried to drink, his water transformed into molten gold. Even his beloved daughter, whom he accidentally touched, turned into a golden statue. His blessing was, in fact, a curse. Stricken with despair, he begged Dionysus to remove his golden touch. The god agreed, instructing Midas to wash in the river Pactolus to reverse the enchantment. But here's where the story takes a fascinating turn. The river Pactolus, located in what is now modern Turkey, was renowned in ancient times for its rich deposits of gold. Even today, gold dust can be found in its waters. Was this the result of some geological phenomenon? Or could it be that there's some truth to the myth of King Midas after all? What's more, archaeological evidence suggests that the Kingdom of Phrygia was known for its wealth and craft in working with gold. The Midas Mound burial site in Gordian Turkey, named for the legendary king, contained a wealth of golden artifacts when it was excavated in the 1950s. The concept of a cataclysmic flood that wipes out most of life on Earth is a common thread in many ancient cultures, leading us to wonder, could this possibly be grounded in some historical reality? We have the biblical account of Noah's Ark, but there are also similar tales from the ancient Sumerians, Greeks, Hindus, Chinese and Native Americans, among others. Even in an era before global communication, this story seems to have been replicated in cultures thousands of miles apart. So could these flood myths be more than just stories? In the Epic of Gilgamesh, one of the oldest known works of literature dating back to ancient Sumeria, we encounter the story of Utnapishtim. Utnapishtim was warned by the god Enki of a coming flood and instructed to build a boat to save himself, his family and all the animals. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? The parallels between this story and the biblical account of Noah are uncanny. In Greece, we have the myth of Deucalion and Pyrrha, who were the only survivors of a great deluge sent by an angry Zeus. In Hindu mythology, there's the story of Manu who builds a boat to survive a flood that engulfs the earth. These stories, despite originating from different cultures and time periods, share a remarkable similarity. It's easy to dismiss these tales as coincidental or symbolic, but geological evidence suggests that large-scale flooding did occur in various parts of the world at different times. For instance, around 5,600 BC, a catastrophic event known as the Black Sea Deluge may have flooded a vast area of land. Another fascinating theory revolves around the end of the last ice age, around 10,000 BC, when melting ice caps would have caused sea levels to rise significantly, potentially submerging coastal civilizations and giving rise to flood legends. In North America, there's evidence of the Missoula floods, a series of cataclysmic floods that occurred between 15,000 and 13,000 years ago at the end of the last ice age. These floods, caused by the periodic rupturing of ice dams, were of such a scale that they dramatically altered the landscape of parts of Washington, Oregon and Idaho. So while we can't say for certain that any one of these flood myths is a direct account of these events, the geological evidence does suggest that our ancient ancestors had to deal with catastrophic floods. Their collective memory of these terrifying events may have been passed down through generations, slowly morphing into the flood myths we know today. The idea of a great flood, it seems, may not be entirely mythical after all. It's a fascinating testament to the way humans, across cultures and across time, make sense of the natural world and its sometimes catastrophic events. The ancient city of Helak, often referred to as the real-life Atlantis, is a fascinating tale of an entire city that supposedly disappeared overnight. The city was an important center of the Achaean civilization, predating Athens and holding significant power and influence in the region. It was famed for its sanctuary of Poseidon, the god of the sea, earthquakes and horses. The story goes that one fateful winter night in 373 BC, the city was obliterated. But this was no ordinary destruction. 
According to ancient texts, the city sank into a lagoon, disappearing beneath the waves in a single night, following a combination of a powerful earthquake and a subsequent tsunami. The city, its buildings and its inhabitants were lost beneath the sea, leaving no trace on the surface. The event was so catastrophic that it was said to have inspired the philosopher Plato's account of Atlantis. But was Helike just a myth? For centuries the story was treated as such, until modern archaeologists decided to investigate. In the late 20th century, a team led by Greek archaeologist Dora Katsinopoulou launched an expedition to find the lost city. After a lengthy search in 2001, they finally found something remarkable. Ruins submerged in a lagoon near the village of Rizomelos, including a large building with archaic walls, classical ceramic fragments, and even bronze artifacts, all dated back to when Helica was supposed to have existed. The findings suggested that the city had been struck by a massive earthquake which liquefied the ground, a process known as soil liquefaction. This, coupled with the tsunami that followed, would have swallowed up the city, much as the ancient texts described. Excavations are still ongoing, but every uncovered artifact adds credibility to a story once thought to be a myth. When we think of the Amazons, images of fierce, independent warrior women might spring to mind thanks to Greek mythology. These women were said to have lived apart from men, only interacting with them for procreation. They were described as equals to men in physical agility and courage, legendary for their skills in battle and their ruthlessness. But how much of this was myth and how much was reality? Ancient Greek historians such as Herodotus wrote detailed accounts of the Amazons, but for a long time these stories were treated as just that, stories. The idea of a society of warrior women living in a land beyond the realms of the known world seemed fantastical. But then, archaeology stepped in and offered us a different perspective. In the 1990s, a series of graves were uncovered in the Eurasian steppe, specifically in areas around modern-day Russia and Kazakhstan, which dramatically changed our understanding of the Amazons. The graves contained the remains of women buried with weapons, including arrows and spears, as well as horse-riding gear, equipment that mirrored what was described in the tales of the Amazons. Even more striking was the evidence of battle scars on the bones, including arrowheads lodged in the bodies, indicating that these women were not just buried with weapons for symbolic reasons. They were warriors who had actively participated in combat. These findings suggest that the myth of the Amazons might have been inspired by real warrior women from the Scythian culture a nomadic group that inhabited these areas. This discovery has had a profound impact on how we interpret the myth of the Amazons. It suggests that the ancient Greeks may have had contact with these warrior women, either through trade or warfare, and their stories were then woven into the rich tapestry of Greek mythology. We've journeyed from the walls of Troy to the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, from the touch of King Midas to the shores of the lost city of Helag. We've seen how the myth of the fierce Amazon women held a reality. These instances show us that the boundary between myth and reality is not as rigid as we might think. Indeed, our understanding of the past is an ever-evolving tapestry of fact, interpretation and storytelling. Picture this, a perfectly formed human skull made entirely out of quartz crystal. Sounds like something out of a sci-fi movie, right? Well, such objects do exist and they're steeped in mystery and controversy. The most famous of these is the Mitchell Hedges skull, named after its discoverer. But where did this skull come from? Who made it? How was it crafted so perfectly with details that seem beyond the capability of primitive tools? And perhaps most intriguingly, why was it made? Today, let's delve into the enigmatic world of the crystal skulls, starting with the remarkable Mitchell Hedges skull. The discovery of the Mitchell Hedges skull is deeply entwined in the lore of exploration and archaeology. Is the year 1924, and we find ourselves accompanying British explorer Frederick Albert Mitchell Hedges on his journey into the jungles of what is now known as Belize. He was drawn to the region by stories of an ancient city, Lubantun, which translates to City of Fallen Stones in the Mayan language. Mitchell Hedges was not just an explorer, but an adventurer and a writer ever in pursuit of the world's enigmas. His adopted daughter, Anna Mitchell Hedges, was with him on this trip, and she is credited with the skull's discovery. Picture this, a birthday expedition on her 17th birthday, exploring a crumbled altar inside a Mayan temple, when her eyes caught the glint of something unusual beneath the fallen stones. 
That something was an extraordinarily well-preserved crystal skull, almost perfectly accurate to human anatomy. Anna claimed that upon holding it, she experienced a sense of indescribable awe. This was no ordinary archaeological find. It was a tangible, almost unsettling connection to the mystifying past of an ancient civilization. Or, as some skeptics might argue, it was a masterful hoax that would become one of the most controversial artifacts of the 20th century. The debate, it seems, is just as multifaceted as the crystal itself. Diving deeper into the rabbit hole of the Mitchell Hedges skull, let's talk about the skull's unique characteristics, a category it reigns supreme in amongst the known crystal skulls. This object of mystery is made from clear quartz crystal, also known as rock crystal, and its size nearly matches a small human cranium. Weighing in at an astonishing 11.7 pounds, the skull's level of craftsmanship is what sets it apart. It's a work of staggering complexity, even down to the minutest detail. The jaws, for instance, are detachable and fit perfectly into the upper cranium. This level of intricacy is a stark contrast to the more traditional fixed jaw designs of other crystal skulls. And let's not forget the prism at the base of the cranium and the lenses in the eye sockets, which create a surprisingly lifelike pair of eyes. But it doesn't stop at mere aesthetics. Its creator's understanding of the material goes beyond basic sculpting. The skull is pieced together in a way that respects the natural axes of the quartz crystal, which would have minimized the risk of the crystal shattering during creation. That's an understanding of crystallography you'd expect from a modern material scientist, not a civilization from over a millennium ago. Then comes the enigma of how it was crafted. Given the hardness of quartz crystal, the use of metal tools would have left discernible tool marks. Yet no such marks are found on the skull. It's as if it was magically shaped without any tools. This absence of tool marks has led to theories of it being wish or thought into existence, though that's a concept even more elusive than the skull itself. Now let's take a journey into the realm of speculation hypotheses and the wild wonderland of unbridled conjecture. As I mentioned earlier, there are numerous theories about the origins of the Mitchell Hedges skull. Some say it's a remnant from lost civilizations like Atlantis or Lemuria, while others suggest extraterrestrial origin. The Atlantean theory, for instance, suggests that the Mitchell Hedges skull, like the other crystal skulls, is a legacy left behind by the mythical civilization of Atlantis, believed by some to have been an advanced society with capabilities beyond our current understanding. Imagine that, a society so developed that they were able to craft an object like this without leaving a single tool mark. Fascinating, isn't it? Meanwhile, the Lemurian theory suggests that the skull was a creation of Lemuria, another legendary lost civilization reputedly located in the Indian or Pacific Ocean. Proponents of this theory believe that Lemuria was home to spiritually advanced beings who use quartz crystal for a variety of purposes, including healing, communication and record keeping. Could the skull be a relic of their high culture? Taking a quantum leap into the realm of science fiction, some propose that the skull was left behind by extraterrestrial visitors. If an alien civilization possessed technology far exceeding our own, it could explain the seemingly impossible craftsmanship, right? Well, maybe. Finally, there's the more grounded archaeological theory that it is a product of pre-Columbian Mesoamerican cultures. The Mesoamericans, especially the Aztecs and Mayans, were known for their intricate carvings and detailed artworks. Yet even their abilities would be pushed to the limit by the creation of something as intricate as the Mitchell Hedges skull. Each theory, however fantastical, adds another layer to the enigmatic allure of the skull. It invites us to question, to wonder, and most importantly, to keep exploring the mysteries of our past, whether they be grounded on Earth or scattered across the cosmos. Ah, controversy. It's the spice that makes any mystery more tantalizing. And trust me, when it comes to the Mitchell Hedges skull, there's no shortage of controversy. Firstly, the story of its discovery has been called into question. Anna Mitchell Hedges, the one credited with discovering the skull, didn't actually mention the find until many years after the supposed event. Also, there's no official archaeological documentation or field notes that mention the skull's discovery. The absence of these records raises eyebrows, doesn't it? Moreover, questions have been raised about the skull's physical characteristics. 
Despite its remarkable detail, some skeptics argue that the skull's perfect prismatic finish could only be achieved with modern tools and techniques. In fact, a study by the British Museum suggested that the skull was likely carved using jeweler's equipment developed in the 19th century. This contradicts the idea that it's a product of an ancient civilization. Perhaps the most compelling criticism comes from the fact that no similar skulls have been found in any confirmed archaeological excavations. Most other known crystal skulls have been proven to be fakes, further casting a shadow of doubt over the authenticity of the Mitchell Hedges skull. To add to the intrigue, the skull's provenance prior to its discovery is murky. F.A. Mitchell Hedges, Anna's adoptive father, was actually in possession of the skull before the claimed discovery. He reportedly purchased it at a Sotheby's auction in London in 1943. It's a whirlwind of mystery, and while the allure of the skull tempts us to romanticize its origin, we must remember the importance of empirical evidence and methodical investigation. After all, it's the pursuit of truth that leads us on these thrilling journeys of inquiry, isn't it? Now, despite all the skepticism and controversy, the Mitchell Hedges skull continues to captivate us. There's something about an unresolved mystery, isn't there? It's like a puzzle that's missing a few pieces. Frustrating, yes, but intriguing all the same. Let's step back for a moment. We've pondered over the origins of the skull, marveled at its physical characteristics, and even dived into the whirlpool of skepticism. But what does this enigmatic artifact represent in the grander scheme of things? In one way, the skull is a symbol of human curiosity. We yearn to uncover the secrets of our past, to understand our roots. And sometimes, in this search, we stumble upon artifacts like the skull which defy easy explanation. They challenge our perceptions, pushing us to rethink and reassess our understanding of history. Moreover, the skull also represents the ongoing debate between belief and skepticism, between faith in extraordinary tales and adherence to empirical evidence. It's a testament to our eternal quest for knowledge and the hurdles we face in separating fact from fiction. Finally, the skull is a reminder of the rich tapestry of human culture. Whether it's a relic from a lost civilization or a more recent creation, it bears the marks of human craftsmanship, creativity and ingenuity. It serves as a mirror, reflecting our own preoccupations with mystery, power and the unknown. So there it is, the Mitchell Hedges skull, a prism through which we explore not just history, but also the human condition. It's more than just an artifact. It's a symbol, a challenge, a story. There is an undeniable fascination associated with the crystal skulls. They have permeated popular culture, appearing in novels and even Hollywood films. But why? Why are these skulls so important? Crystal skulls, including the Mitchell Hedges skull, hold a certain enigmatic charm. Their allure stems from the intricate craftsmanship they display and the mysteries that surround their origins. This combination captivates the human imagination, invoking a sense of wonder and curiosity. But their importance extends beyond their aesthetic appeal or the mysteries they present. These skulls encourage us to explore the realms of archaeology, history and even spirituality. They foster an interest in ancient civilizations and their cultural practices, pushing us to expand our knowledge and understanding of our shared human past. In the context of spirituality, many people believe that these skulls hold a special energy or power. They are seen as tools for healing, meditation and personal development. Whether or not you subscribe to these beliefs, the skulls do encourage introspection and a quest for personal growth. And let's not forget their role in stimulating scientific inquiry. The controversy surrounding the authenticity of the skulls has prompted rigorous scientific investigation. Techniques such as electron microscopy and computerized tomography CT scans have been used to study the skulls, leading to advancements in archaeological analysis. So the importance of the crystal skulls is multifaceted. They are not just objects of historical interest, but catalysts for cultural, spiritual and scientific exploration. These skulls continue to hold our attention, urging us to question, to explore and to learn, making our world just a bit more fascinating. So, what are we left with? The crystal skulls, especially the Mitchell Hedges skull, remain an enigma. They encapsulate the intrigue of archaeology, the allure of ancient civilizations, the contention of scientific debate and the curiosity of spiritual seekers. Whether these skulls are truly the work of ancient Mesoamericans, 
extraterrestrial beings or merely skilled forgers, one thing is certain, they continue to fascinate us, to challenge our understanding and to spur us on in our quest for knowledge. And as always, thanks for watching.